Well, hello and welcome. My name is Danny Parker, or at least I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, I am so glad to be here. I, I mean, this genuinely makes me so happy. This is what brings me the most joy in my life, is being in front of people and, and talking and, and uh, hopefully, you know, helping improve other people's lives and to make their journey as, as enjoyable as, as my journey is for me. Um, so yeah, you're, you are literally helping me fulfill my destiny by being here today. Today we're gonna to talk about our bodies and how, uh, how we can become the best version of ourselves because we have a really healthy, happy person that's inside of us and all we have to do is just do the right things and it, and it will come out. It will slowly replace, replace the, the crappy old version that we have that we're walking around with all the time. And I'm gonna throw some ideas out to you today that are gonna be kinda of hard for you to wrap your brain around and I need you to be open-minded because uh, I really want you to forget pretty much anything that you've learned, uh, anything that you know about food and nutrition because it's all gonna just go out the window. So do we have any questions so far? If you, rather than raise your hands, I mean, I just want you to put your fist on top of your head. So if anybody has, you know, instead of raising your hands, so does anybody have any questions? No? Okay, cool. Just do that. About 20 years ago, I was pretty unfit. I was uh, very overweight, didn't feel very well, wasn't doing very well. Um, and, but I just, you know, I just thought, oh, I'll, you know, it'll, I'll take care of it, it'll, you know, whatever. And was like that for a while, and so just finally just said, I have to lose weight. I, I was getting married, and I didn't want to be, you know, unhealthy. And uh, so I really set off on a journey to, uh, basically at that time, was just to lose weight. And so I did, you know, what everybody does, just counted calories and was able to do really well, um, but I just didn't feel well. I just always felt tired and weak. And so even though I had lost a bunch of weight, uh, I got to the point where, and, and I had been, my gauge for how fit that I felt was mowing my, mowing my grass. Uh, because I had been mowing, mowing my grass for years and years and years, and, and I had lost this weight, and now I couldn't even mow my grass, self-propelled mower, out there for an hour, and I would just be done, and I'd just be like, oh, what is going on? So I pretty much, at that point, just decided that, well, I'm just not going to be able to, to do it anymore. And so I hired it out. I was hiring guys to, to mow my grass. And... Uh, so, you know, some more time passed and, and I, you know, still didn't feel very well. I looked pretty good, but I didn't feel very well. Um, and it just, uh, it was just one of those things where it just kept wearing on me, kept wearing on me. And I had stiffness in the side of my neck and I had arthritis in these joints in my thumbs to where I got to the point to where I couldn't even pick up things. Um, to where it, it affected how I would sleep or how, how I would sit. And uh, so about six or seven years ago, I just said, uh, this is it. I, I, I need, I really need to find something that works. Um, and so that's when I really, really set off on my journey was, was about six or seven years ago. And it was just to, to discover and to learn everything that I can about health, because unless we're actively doing that, we're, we're going on old information. We're, unless we are actively seeking new latest knowledge, we're going off old, outdated information. I mean, that's why, that's why if you have an accountant, what, that's why they go and take tax classes every year because things change, things get updated, things they, they, need to, they need to stay fresh. I mean, it's just like anything else. You need to, you know, we need to be educated on, on the, the latest and greatest stuff. So speaking of being educated, I'm not actually educated in this field other than the fact that I have just done all this research and it's been trial and error and I've, and I've been just you know, ravenous about finding the latest information and getting as many sources together as possible to see what overlaps and what's common and, and what is true and, then, and what is not. You know, and that was the most difficult part when I started on this was just, there was just so much information. And I had so much information that was left over in my head from things that I had, you know, learned my whole life. And a lot of, uh, one of the worst sources of information about our health is the media. So just don't, don't believe what magazines and, and TV and, and those things say unless you're getting it from other sources as well, unless they're reinforcing something that you've do already done research on. So I, so I guess my whole point is that uh, we, we can achieve 
uh, better health by making better choices about what we eat. And it really comes down mostly to what it is that we eat. Uh, and I realize that for some, the, limits, the, the choices are limited and that there are people that you're helping every day who don't have food at all. I mean, I understand that. But the more we know and, and the, more, the more we educate ourselves, the better choices that we make and the more people we can help. The human body has this amazing power to heal itself. And all we have to do is, uh, is, is just let it do that. And by eating the right foods and doing the right things, our body will heal, heal itself much better, much faster, more efficiently, and in, in ways that we can't even imagine. A lot of people think that, and I used to think this too, that our health or the level of our health or our fitness and those sorts of things are determined by, uh, by our genes because we're a lot like our parents and our kids are a lot like us and you know, you, we just think that, that it's, it's genetics. And actually genetics is only like a really small percentage. It's only like five or 10% of who we are comes from our genetics. So what happens is, is that the genetics really come into, uh, that part of it really comes into being true is when, we, when our body starts to break down, when we have disease. So, so because of the, uh, the genetic shortcomings that we get from our parents, from our ancestors, they manifest themselves the same way generations after generations. So it's not, it, it, so it's mostly lifestyle that, that is why kids are like their parents or like their parents. Um, and it's very, very little to do with genetics. So if you think of it this way, and this, this is how I, how, how I sort of sorted it out. Um, if you look at like your Facebook friends, for example, you have, you have like these families that are your Facebook friends, they're all just fit. You know, and your first thought would be like, oh, well, that's their genetics and all that sort of stuff. It's mostly their lifestyle. I mean, normally you see, you know, a fit man and a fit woman get together and it's because they have the similar lifestyle and they have kids and they're fit and so on and so on. And then you have other families that are, uh, who are less active and have different routines and different traditions and diff those sorts of things. And that's why they're, they're the same. So it has more to do with lifestyle than it does with genetics. Uh, because yeah, that's, that was my thing for a long time. I was just like, well, I'm just this way because my parents were this way. You know, I mean, I'm just, I'm just destined, destined to be that way. And just so you know, it, that's just not true. I guess the hardest thing for me to realize and the, and the hardest thing for me to, to describe along these lines is that uh, we don't know how bad we feel right now because this is how we feel. We're, we've sort of acclimated to it. This is just, we are on our normal ground right now. And for me, it wasn't until I really, really started seeing the benefits and I got the ball rolling and felt sort of feeling better and better and better that I realized how bad I felt 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was very unhealthy and very unfit because it happens slowly and you just think, oh, this, you know, this is just how I am. So it's hard to, it's hard to imagine, but, but right now we don't feel as good as we're capable of feeling. I've sort of made a list of the things that are like the, um, the big bad three, I call them. And it's uh, high blood sugar, inflammation, and a fatty liver. Okay, so a uh, little bit about high blood sugar, uh, high insulin is that the foods that we eat, every time that we eat, we spike insulin in, in, in our bodies. Okay, um, and what happens is, is our, our, uh, our American diet is just full of carbohydrates and it's full of other things that are keeping our insulin level high all the time. So we're just flooded with blood sugars, blood, high blood sugar all the time. And high blood sugar causes damage. It causes us to uh, gain weight. Uh, just, it, it's just nearly every single bad thing that happens in the human body is a result of high blood sugar. People will talk about symptoms. They'll say, well, these symptoms, these, 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 those all basically come back to uh, high blood sugar in our system. And that, that comes directly from our diet. Uh, the other thing that we're all experiencing most of the time, if not all the time, is inflammation. And when I first heard, heard about this, I'm just like, inflammation, what are you talking about? Because I would think of inflammation be like if you sprained your ankle or if you cut yourself and it would get red or whatever. But the reality of it is, is that because our, our blood sugar level is so high, um, we have inflammation everywhere in our body all the time, right down to a cellular level. So right now our cells are going, ah, enough sugar, enough, enough, oh, I just need to heal, help me heal. 
So if you can imagine every little cell in your body uh, being all pink and red and you know, going like, oh, oh, this is terrible, come on, help me out. And then the third thing is uh, our liver. And uh, most of us have a fatty liver. The easiest way to tell if, if, if a person or if I have a fatty liver is if I, have, if I have some belly around here, that means I have a fatty liver. Because, because our, our liver is right here and it puts any extra fat right next to it. And most of us, and a lot of people, even though there are people who are thin who, who have a bad, uh, poor diet, they still can have a fatty liver, even though they may not have much belly fat, but it's, and it's because the, the liver gets full of loaded with fat. Well, you know, I was just amazed the more I learned about our liver and how much it does. Because we always hear about our brain and our stomach and our heart, you know, and, and uh, all the packages in the store, you know, heart healthy and heart happy and all that sort of stuff. Well, there's a reason for that, and it's because most of us are going to die from heart disease. I mean, that's how most people on the planet die, wind up dying is from some form of, of heart disease. So that's understandable why you know, we want to take care of our heart. But our liver is actually, a, 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 like, I think it's like the most important organ because it's the workhorse. It filters out all the toxins, the sugars. It, it puts the nutrition, nu nutrients and the vitamins and all the good stuff that's in our food, food it, it puts it where it needs to go, sends it off in the right direction. And our liver is this, this nasty thing that filters out all the crap that we are exposed to, the stuff that we eat, the stuff that you know, is exposed to our body. It just filters out all of that stuff. And our, our liver is so important and it's so robust that I've read that even if we only have like 20%, it might even be less than that, 20% of our liver is working properly because we've, we've damaged it so much. Even if just 20% of our liver is working properly, it's still doing its job. It can still handle everything that it needs to do. So, so that's sort of like a built-in thing for us, you know, that we evolved this way that uh, because our liver was going to deal with so much bad stuff, that it was going to deteriorate over time. That's, that's, it, it, it just knows it's gonna have to do that. But the better care that we take of our liver, the better job, the easier job that it has, and the, more, the, the, the healthier we will be because of it. So you know, those, are, those are the big three. And, and even though a fatty liver and inflammation come from uh, high insulin, it, I think it's still important to sort of like you know, point each, each one of those out. And those are all because of our diet. So, you know, now you're probably asking yourself, well, what, or what do I do? You know, what, what sort of diet are you talking about? Well, I call it, and I may have heard this somewhere, I call it the proper human diet. We've been looking for the magic uh, pill. We've been looking for the magic combination or the answer to what is the simple answer to, you know, correcting all these problems that we have. The simple answer is we're not eating food that's meant for humans to eat. The most readily available food isn't, isn't human food. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if I were you at this point and you're just thinking, oh, well, what do we do? I think, you know, I go to the store, I spend all this money on food. It's delicious. It's, you know, it's, it has stuff in it that's good for me. You know, what, 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 what are you talking about? What, what is this human diet? Well, I've given you these lists some of the things in the, on this list is, is going to uh, really kind of warp your brain because it goes against things that we've been told our whole lives, our parents have been told, it's, it's, and there's just a lot of misinformation out there. I would just say, as soon as possible, start replacing the things on the not list with things that are on the do list. But the most important part about all of this is reducing our intake of carbohydrates because they're, they're killing us. So just to go real quickly, I'm gonna hit some highlights here um, and not go too long on this. P potatoes and corn, they're just out. I mean, you gotta start whittling those down. Those, you, uh, don't even include those as on your list of vegetables because they're just so bad for you and they're in everything and they're everywhere. They're just really high in starch and carbs. Um, and there are, there are good substitutions. You know, I mean, do your research, go online, find a substitution for, uh, for potatoes. Uh, uh, cauliflower is a real good one you can get. 
a mashed cauliflower, frozen mashed cauliflower. And um, anyway, so just do your research on that. Uh, the next one that's the biggest one that's the hardest one for me are the starches and the grain flours. So all that good stuff that we eat so much of that it's part of every single meal, rice, breads, buns, tortillas, pastas, you know, all that stuff. What's really awesome now is that there are some really good uh, low net carb uh, tortillas and low net carb uh, bread. And, and, if you, and if you're not familiar with what net carbs are, I can show you here. So, uh, so, so when you're looking at the nutritional label uh, on, a, on, a, on a package, and I really, really can't stress enough how we need to be reading these labels because of the ingredients. To figure a net carb, you know, all of these labels are, are, are pretty much standardized. And so to find out what the net carbs are in something or other, you, you look for the total carbohydrates. So in this example, uh, this, and this is, these are both bread, one, a single slice of bread. So in this one, a single slice of bread has 14 grams of carbohydrates, but it has one gram of fiber. We get to subtract the fiber from the carbs. Okay, so this slice of bread has 13 grams of carbs, which is one less, but it has 11 grams of fiber. So we get to subtract the fiber from the carbohydrates. So this slice of bread only has two. This one has 13, this one has two. So if you eat two slices of bread here, you've got some number that I can't figure. Where here, it would just be two and two is four. So that's how, that's how you look for, look for what the net carbs is. And the net carb, that's something that you're hearing more and more of, and, and you will hear more about are, are net carbs. It's one of those things like everything else, the, the, the more we buy, the more the demand is for it, and the price will, will go down. Uh, the alternative is, is to just eat half as much bread or just carve out as much bread out of your diet as you possibly can. Okay, the next on the list is sweets. Anything sweet. I mean anything sweet and don't believe it when something says you know that it's sugar free because uh there's there's a nasty little ingredient that's called maltodextrin it's here on the list if you look at this list of the glycemic index what this is is these are sweeteners artificial and otherwise and if you look at the column on the right, the glycemic index, that shows the impact that it has on our blood sugar. So right up there at the very top, and this is just how it is. I didn't invent this list. This is just how it is. At the very top there is 110, is, and, and those numbers are just relative right, to each other. And then you have on the, other, on the other column at the bottom, you have something like stevia that's a zero. So... If you're, if you're going for a sweetener that isn't sugar, you certainly want to have stevia rather than maltodextrin because maltodextrin is going to spike you to 110. And if you go down a little bit underneath maltodextrin, go down a little bit, you can see sucrose there is high, highlighted. That's just table sugar. That's only 65. So you have, you have packaged sweeteners out there that say the, that they're zero calorie because maltodextrin doesn't necessarily have a lot of calories in it, but it will spike your insulin worse than table sugar. So there are, these, there, there are people out there who are diabetic that are buying these uh, sugar substitutes that say zero calorie and zero sugar, and it's worse for them than if they had just eaten sugar. So that's just to show you how bad maltodextrin is. So when you're reading your labels um, and you're looking at things that are sweet and say no sugar or you know, calorie free or whatever, look at the list of labels and if it says maltodextrin in there, just don't buy it. You're better off buying the good old-fashioned stuff, which you shouldn't be buying anyway. Um, I know this lean and processed meats is going to sound weird because, you know, I mean, it's cold cuts, and, you know, you think they're low in fat and all that sort of stuff. Uh, cold cuts and lean deli meats, those are usually full of fillers and things that aren't good for you. It's just not a quality protein. And I'll explain this one later, the low-fat dairy. Just don't buy low-fat dairy stuff. I know this sounds crazy, but... You, you want full fat dairy. If you're, buying, if you're buying meat or if you're buying dairy, you want the full fat stuff. Our bodies, our bodies are made of fat. Our bodies want fat. Our bodies need fat. But we need the real fat that comes from real food, that comes from, the, you know, the best source is cows. I mean, cows are freaking awesome. 
So, oh, this is a big one. So, so my two main things that I want to stress more than anything is reducing the carbohydrate intake, but more than anything, we have to stop using seed oils, vegetable oils, because, because these are chemicals made in a chemical factory and they're poison. They are, they are literally poison. So, you know, I mean, there are, a lot of them are listed there and there are more than just these. But don't get hung up on this. I mean, because, uh, you know, I first thought of like, you know, the oil that you have in a container that you bake with and you cook with and you fry with and all that sort of stuff. But soybean oil is one of the most used oils and it's in freaking everything. So when you buy chips, those are, those are fried in soybean oil or another one of these seed oils or a combination. When you buy salad dressings, salad dressings, the first ingredient on a list of ingredients is the most is the most ingredient used in that particular product. You look at salad dressing, the first thing is soybean oil. So we, we think, oh, I'm gonna get fit, I'm gonna get healthy, I'm gonna start eating salads, and you know, you pour this salad dressing on there. Well, most of them are loaded with sweeteners and, uh, and a lot of them with maltodextrin, um, but they're made, the base is soybean oil. So, and speaking of cooking with these seed oils is there's a thing that happens on a molecular level when you heat these seed oils, they become carcinogenic. It's just, it's, it's like, you might as well just be drinking cancer if you're heating or eating things that have been heated in these seed oils. I, I can't stress this enough. I've said it enough. It, they're, they are poison. They're literally poison. So, you know, you have like mayonnaise and Miracle Whip and margarine and, margarine and other things like that that are based in these, uh, these oils. And just, you'll, as soon as you start reading your label, labels, you'll just be like, God, there's soybean oil in everything. We have to really, really reduce the amount of fruit and fruit juices that we consume down to as close to zero as possible. And I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking what I thought for years and years and years. I'm getting vitamin C from this orange, orange juice. I'm getting vitamin C from this, you know, juice, whatever it is. Well, aside from the fact that, that fruits now have been, have, are, are way more sweeter than they were in the past. So if you were to eat an orange 100 years ago, you would just go, good, and it tastes like an orange at all because, because all the fruits are sweeter now because we like them more, we're gonna buy more of these, they're better, they're better, they're better, because there's, it's just because they've been made to be sweeter. Okay, so, so we're drinking this orange juice and we're just thinking, oh, this is full of vitamin C and you know, fruity goodness and everything. Well, that's fructose, the sugar, natural sugar. You think, oh, natural sugar, that's fructose. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, look at your other list. Fructose is, is on here, and you're just sort of like, well, that's still, it's, it's low. It's like a 25, but um, our body doesn't really care if it's natural sugar or if it's regular sugar. As soon as we consume it and our body converts it over to sugar, it, that's, just, that's just what it is. And so what happens is the very little bit of nutritional value that is in fruit is completely canceled out by how much sugar that there, there is in it. You see what I'm saying? So you're thinking you're doing yourself good, but there, it's mostly bad and a little bit of good there. And, the, and the, the reality of it is, is that because of the sugar that's in there, you're not even getting the nutritional value at all. It's, it's pretty much zero. And to make it even worse, if you're drinking juice, so any juice or most juices that uh, are uh, packaged that you buy in the store are pasteurized, which means they're heated. So even if there was any natural nutritional value left in there, as soon as it's heated, it's gone. You might as well be drinking soda pop if you're drinking fruit juice. And I know that's really, really hard to, to fathom, but that, that, that is the actual truth of it all. And it's, it's the same for, fruit, for vegetable juices, because I, I like tomato juice. I really, it's my whole life I've loved tomato juice. And I used to think, oh, I'm drinking V8 juice. That's, I don't have to eat vegetables. I'm, I'm, I'm drinking V8 juice. You know, look at the, all these vitamins that are in here. Well, the vitamins that are in there, they're very, very small amounts. And if you're thinking in terms of like vitamin C, for example, the vitamin C that is on the label of something and that you're drinking this for the vitamin C, that's actually added back in. Those, those things are fortified. The, the, the vitamin C that is in things is made from cornstarch. It's, it's made in a factory. It's made in a chemical factory and it's added in. That's not good vitamin C. Any vitamins that you could get from fruits, you can get from vegetables. Soda pop, just soda, it's, it's just out. It's just out, no matter what sort of sweetener or whatever is in that. 
I, I have found there is a, a soda that's actually really good that's called uh, Zevia, I think, that's made with um, Stevia. And uh, I mean, I'm not really a soda drinker, but if you need soda, go with something like that. Beer, wine, mixed drinks, uh, they're, they're just out. Um, reduce as much as possible. Get it, get it down to as, as few as, as possible. Oh my gosh, me and my friends used to go out and, you know, and get these giant, giant margaritas and drink those and you know, four or five hours later just be like, oh my God, I feel so terrible. Why did I drink that great big? And I always thought it was, it was the alcohol that was in it. It's not. It's the high fructose corn syrup that's in those things. It's the sugar. It's the, it's the crashing of our lives happening in our brain because we just drank so much sugar. You're actually better off, and this was something that I discovered independent of this uh, health thing, is that uh, we're actually better off just drinking straight, uh, straight liquor. Yeah, seriously. Because, because your, our bodies can actually metabolize that alcohol uh, easier than it can uh, all the other sh the other sugars that are that are in these uh, are, that are in beer and wine and stuff like that. The downside is though is that if you do a couple of shots of vodka or gin or tequila or something like that, your our liver has to has to metabolize that has to process that. But what happens is is I can go out and I can eat a really really good low carb very healthy very satisfying meal and do you know uh, some some vodka with that. As soon as that gets into my liver, my liver will always, always process the sugar and the alcohol first. And it may take a day or two for our body to, to process alcohol like that. So all of that good food that I'm eating, it's just sort of like, eh, it might as well have, not even eat. Because the liver is just like going, I'll get to that, I'll get to that, it's this, 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 this. Our bodies, our bodies don't like being full of sugar. And so what our body tries to, to do is it tries to get rid of it fastest because it sees it as, as a poison, as, as, an, as an invader. Our body runs much more efficiently and much happier if we're burning our own fat rather than burning the sugar that's in our blood because of all the crap that we ate. But what happens is because our diets are so full of, of foods that convert to sugar, we have a high, high sugar all the time, and so our body's processing that, 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 and it's more than we need, so the extra sugar, it just stores it as fat. Where if we weren't consuming that high sugar diet, it would start burning the fat. But instead, every time we eat, we're just making more fat. So if we stop eating the foods that are, that are raising our blood sugar, our bodies will naturally start burning its favorite fuel to burn, which is our own fat. That's what it's for. It's there for our fuel. Don't buy anything. Oh my gosh. Don't buy anything that says uh, fat-free, low-fat, light, sugar-free, low-cal, keto, and all that sort of stuff. That's just marketing. Um, yeah. And the, 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 the big thing here when, while we're talking about food is just try to just buy real food. Don't buy food that comes in packages. If you're buying food in packages, make sure it's just the, the smallest part of what you're buying. And, um, and uh, yeah, I had somebody point this out to me, which is really, really, really cool. When you go to the store, spend most of your time on the edge, around the edges. Probably have heard that before. Because when you go in, there's the produce. That's right there on that front edge. And usually right behind the produce are the frozen. You're much better off having frozen than you are having anything that comes in a tin because vegetables that are in a can, again, they have been... Uh, pasteurized, they've been heated, and so you're getting very little nutritional value. Not getting as much nutritional value, let's say, as if you were eating fresh or frozen. And then, the, you know, the, the protein, the meat, and the cheeses are on one side of the store, and then the, you know, the dairy and the eggs and stuff like that are on another side of the store. Just mostly stay around the outside, and then only go into the middle to get, you know, those uh, extra things. So I want you to take these, take these lists and, and you know, just sort of think about or even write down on these lists, you know, the questions that I've asked there is like, what, are the, what things here are the hardest to avoid and what things are the easiest to avoid? And you know, like I'm always talking about, is just start on the easy ones first. The things that are on here that you're just like, oh, I don't have a problem with that. Because me, I'm not, I'm not a sweet person, so I don't really have much problem with cutting out sweets. 
uh, for me, it's chips and pasta and stuff like that. That's where I, where I had difficulty. So start working on the stuff, cutting out the stuff that's the easiest to do, and then start working on the other ones that are, that are the next easiest and all that sort of stuff. But these are just ways to start moving in the right direction. I mean, if you had told me 10 years ago what my diet and my lifestyle would be, uh, would be now, I, would have, I would just would have said, there's just no way. But I didn't go from 10 years ago to today. It's just been a long, slow process. It's been trial and error. And uh, there are definitely things in the first couple of years that I did religiously that are just completely out now because I learned more as I went along. And I also learned what worked for me. We all have to find what works for us. I mean, it'd be real easy for, for someone to say, well, this is what you need to do. You need to do. I know it sounds like that I'm saying that. What I'm saying is, is, is take this information in and use it to your advantage. You can, you can do it. If I can do it, I know anybody can do it. Oh my gosh, am I, I am just like really the laziest person. I, I really, really am. Okay, so we're going to go through the to-do list really fast because this is going to sound, you know, this is going to make a lot more sense. But cruciferous vegetables. I didn't know what that meant when I first read cruciferous vegetables. I have to look it up, and I still have to look up crucis. Cru, cru, it doesn't matter what they're called. <laughs> if I can't say it, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, broccoli, cauliflower, all that sort of stuff. But as we go along in this list, you'll find that, you know, it's re what's really, really cool is that you know, if you make Brussels sprouts, and why would anybody, but if you make Brussels sprouts, you can load those up with real live bacon and bacon grease and butter and other stuff that are on this list to just make them taste really, really good. Yeah, just think about that. Is it getting close to lunchtime? Seriously, my, my, my mouth is watering. <laughs> I don't even like Brussels sprouts. Anyway, so, you know, go down to the list. Okay, avocado. I, I'm not sure if avocado is officially a vegetable, but uh, an avo avocado is a superfood. So just keep that in mind. As many avocados as you can eat, I really do not like avocados. But over time, I've gotten into uh, buying fresh guacamole that comes in the little things. So avocado is a, is, is a superfood. So, you know, if you can get, get that into, you know, a little bit. Uh, fatty meats. I know this goes against everything that we've learned and we've been taught for decades that you shouldn't eat fatty meats. Those are the best food for you. The, the quality of the protein is really high and because it has animal fat in it, it will keep you satiated longer. So the difference between the good fats and the bad fats, the, the, the bad fats are the omega-6s. Those are the ones that are poison that are made in a factory. And the good fats all come from a natural source and they're not produced in a factory. Well, I guess, you know, their butter is made in a, in a, in a dairy, right? Think of it this way. Uh, margarine is made out of chemicals in a chemical factory. If you want to make butter, you go milk a cow, you put it in a churn and you go like this for a while and you got butter. You can do it in a blender. That's, that's getting a natural fat from a natural source. It's not coming out of a hose into a tanker truck at a factory. <laughs> I know this sounds crazy. Lard, bacon grease, beef tallow, all of those. Cook in those. Don't cook in the stuff that is, is the seed oil, that, that, that's the factory poison. Just switch over to this. You will feel better. You'll feel more satisfied with what you eat. You'll be healthier. You, you will, I promise you. Uh, avocado oil is really good. Extra virgin olive oil is really good. You can buy uh, mayonnaise. That is, it still has blends of soybean oil and some of the other seed oils in it, but at least it's mostly, when you read the label, the first ingredient is avocado oil or, or olive oil. The, you can buy uh, avocado and olive oil based mayonnaises, but they're really, really expensive. But once again, the, the price on that will go down the, the more that people, you know, stop buying the other ones. Um, but the thing, and I buy that, but I don't eat very much of it because it tastes like house paint. So there again, you know, if, if something just doesn't work for you, you just, you can't. So, so I go with the, I go with the, with the blend, the avocado and olive oil blends in, in mayonnaise rather than just saying, well, I can't do the perfect thing here. So I'm just going to do stick with the worst one. There's that middle ground. A lot of things, there's a middle ground where you can find things, you know, that'll work. Um, coconut oil, you know, use that in stuff. 
Uh, when you buy salad dressing, there are salad dressings that are available that are based with olive oil uh, or avocado oil. And again, they're more expensive, uh, but make your own. Just use olive oil and apple cider vinegar for, for your salad dressings. The, one of the very first things that I started doing on my journey was, was doing an ounce of apple cider vinegar uh, with the mother. It's got to be the raw stuff with the mother. Is doing apple cider vinegar every single day. Because of our American diets, uh, because we're doing so much, uh, we're eating so much bad foods, most of us don't have the, the stomach acid that we should. And the, uh, the acid in our stomach is what is like the first line of breaking down, breaking down foods to get the nutrients out that are bound up in the foods. And so our stomachs need to be more acidic. What you don't want to do is to drink apple cider vinegar straight because it'll strip all the nice white enamel off of your teeth permanently. And it also is really, it'll, because it's acid, it just really burns your throat and all that sort of stuff. So what I recommend doing and what I started out doing is I would just get a glass of water, like 12 or 16 ounces, so a nice big glass of water. Or a, a bot, water, you know, water bottle, 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 a water bottle a bottle of water, um, and just mix, mix an ounce in with that. So that's like two tablespoons. Or I just use a shot glass to do a real, a real shot, not a shot. In, not in, um, and uh, so mix that in and just drink that throughout the day or have that, uh, drink half of it with, with, your, with your meals. I mean, ha you know, like for lunch and dinner. Because it, it'll actually do more good if, you've, if you're drinking it with the food that you're eating. Um, so even if I'm having a, a day where I've decided I'm not going to do low carb, let's say it's like around Christmas time and I'm just like, I'm going to have candy and, you know, spaghetti and, you know, all this sort of stuff. I still do apple cider vinegar every single day because it, because it doesn't matter what you're eating. It's still going to help you process that food, break down the nutrients that are in that food. And it's just a good habit to get into and just, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to do that forever. I've been doing it for six, seven years, something like that. I, will, I, I just will forever. And you can buy it in these great big jugs. Also things that you can do that don't necessarily hurt you, but they don't, they don't really even, they don't help you. It's, it's coffee and tea, as long as it's, it's, uh, it's unsweetened. What I do in the morning is I do four ounces of cold brew with a splash of heavy cream in it and no sweetener. The, the heavy cream in there doesn't spike your insulin, but it, it satiates you. So I go all the way to 11, 12, 1 o'clock before I have my first meal of the day. That, the too. Yeah, you can make bulletproof coffee. I mean, it doesn't work in cold brew because it's just a lump of butter. But yes. What's yep. the mother? The mother, if you, look at, if you look at apple cider vinegar, if you look at vinegars, you'll see that there's some that are just regular, and then you have others that have the mother. That means that, that, it's, that it's, it's not been... Uh, pasteurized, and it has the, 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 the junk in the bottom. It has all the... Will the label say? The label will say the mother, because, because this is really getting very popular now uh, that more of them are available. When I first started doing this, there was one bottle on the shelf that I could find that had the mother in it, and now there's like four or five. So yeah, that's the most important part. If you're not getting it with the, with the, with the raw mother in it, don't even bother. So yeah, so you do coffee and tea. Uh, did you have a question, other Melissa, about coffee or tea? I thought maybe I saw you. No? Oh, you're just scratching your head? I hate it when you do that. Uh, if you want to have fruit, you want to have a little bit of fruit, uh, these berries are okay in a small amount. And the reason that chicken isn't on the list of either one of the, the, the avoids or do is because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a really quality source of protein. I mean, it's better than eating lunch meats or whatever, but it can't be fried, can't be bre breaded or fried in the, in the seed oils. Um, but chicken, chicken is okay. So again, when you look at this list, you know, just look at the things that are the easiest and the most difficult and start working on the ones that you can to substitute uh, the other ones. But as far as the good fats, the fatty meats and the vegetables, the, if, if, you, if you can replace the things on the bad list with these things, you will start feeling better faster. These are actually good for us. It's real live human food. How do we go about doing this? Well, you know, my favorite thing is small steps. I call them my nan nano steps. And these, then, and I have my nano steps and all of you need to have your own nano steps. That's why it should be on your list, my nano steps. 
So when you're going back and you're looking at those do's and don'ts on those lists before, your nano steps are going to be, okay, my, one of my nano steps is I need to start buying, I need to replace my seed oils with real live human food oils. I need to. So start making, start making our nano list steps. And one of the big things was, is like I said, is we are eating too many carbohydrates. And I know that it sounds like a fad, you know, oh, it's just a fad. I don't, I, I don't care if it's trendy or not. We're not meant to be eating as many carbohydrates as we are. That's that, that alone is what is the, is the simple answer to why we're all in such poor health, is carbohydrates. That's, that's it. And eating carbohydrates literally makes us hungry. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you what that means. Think in terms of going through uh, our day. So, you know, here's when we get up and here's when, when we go to bed. And then this is the timeline of the day as it goes along. All right. So our normal blood sugar is, is, going to be at a, is going to be at a certain level. So our normal blood sugar, it's going to be going up and down like this throughout the day because of what we eat or our, how we exercise and, and different things like that. Our normal blood sugar is going to be like that. Now, because most of us are eating way too many carbohydrates, our normal standing blood sugar is going to be like up here. So as we go up, this is, this is higher blood sugar, all right? So what happens is we're already starting out at this elevated rate. So... What I mean by carbohydrates make you hungry and carbohydrates make you crave carbohydrates is because we eat a carbohydrate, we have a nice sweet roll for breakfast or a donut or something or other. And what does that do? I mean, we've all experienced this. It spikes our insulin. We have this boost of energy, you know, and it tastes really good and all that sort of stuff. We had this big spike in our blood sugar. Well, what goes up must come down. So what happens is then it comes down, it comes crashing down and when you get into this level here that is below what our standing normal blood sugar is, this is the area where we get hungry. So our body goes, oh my gosh, all that energy is gone now. I need, I need food. You're tired and you're, Ugh. I mean, you know how that feels. So you eat something else and it goes up again. This is, uh, this is a burger and french fries for lunch. All those carbs, it goes up again and it crashes down again. That's the two o'clock thing where it's like, oh man, I'm not gonna make it through this afternoon. It's because your blood sugar is down below what you're, what, even what you're used to, which is already too high. So you're down into the hunger range again. So you have a little snack and then you have your dinner. You see what I mean? So every time we eat this stuff, and even if we're eating uh, the things that are on the do list, Okay, so that may raise a little bit. So like, for example, the, the good fats and the fatty meats that I was talking about, that, all that does is give you this little slow little peak, and, but it goes longer, it keeps you satiated longer. You're more satisfied when you have fatty meats and you have the, the good oils on there. It's not this instant boink. You have a little bit of a spike and it goes for a long time. So the idea, overall idea is to eat foods so that your blood sugars are doing this. It's just these nice, even waves. You don't get hungry. You're not hungry all the time. You're not thinking about food all the time. It freaking works. I'm telling you, it's, it's amazing. And there are, there are some real advanced things that can be done that I do uh, and that I'm working on you know, all the time in order to make this happen. So that's why when I say carbs make you hungry, carbs make you crave more carbs, it, that, is, that is literally what is happening in your body, is the more of that stuff that we eat, the more of that stuff we want. Um, and I know you know what I'm talking about. People always used to say, oh, you know, after Thanksgiving dinner, oh, you feel so low after Thanksgiving dinner. Well, it's because of the tryptophan that's in the turkey. There's like the teeny, teeny, tiniest amount of tryptophan in the turkey. It's because of the stuffing and because of the potatoes and because of, of the, the pie and the cranberry dressing. It's all of those sugars that are in Thanksgiving dinner that you normally don't have all in a big lump like that, you know, in this short little period. That, this paper doesn't go high enough to, to show what the spike from Thanksgiving dinner is, you know? So that's, that's, what, that's what that is all about. And by having this high level of sugar like that, uh, that's, that is also a huge uh, factor in brain fog. 
why, why, were, uh, why can't I concentrate? Uh, well, you know, it's because you, you haven't eaten for two hours, and what you did eat two hours ago is already gone. You, there's no, you, you don't have any energy from that left in you. Where if you were eating good human food, you would. So making these changes, I know. I know, I know, I know, I know this is really, really hard. That's why it's, that's why it's in the nano steps category. I'm going to talk to you what I have called the Sunday night syndrome, okay? Thinking back about Thanksgiving, you all know what this is. It's Sunday night, you've just had your dinner, everything's, you know, the dishes are all put away, everything's all put away, you get your first chance to relax on Sunday evening and you're like, oh, thinking about work tomorrow and you're just sort of like, oh, I'm full. I just had this logy weekend and I was like, oh, tomorrow I'm gonna go on my diet I'm going to uh, exercise, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. You know, that, that's Sunday night syndrome. We've, we have all done that. I would like to know from some of you who have tried this, how long does that last? A week? A couple of days? A couple of hours on, on Monday morning? That's me on Monday morning. I'm like, I am going to, oh, I can't, I'm just going to, bleh. you know? It, it doesn't last. And it, and it just goes back to that thing of, of, Humans, like all living beings, are not meant to change. Everything about us wants to keep doing the same thing that we've been doing. Not because it's the best thing for us, it's just because that's just what we've been doing. So we want to make all of this change. It's just, it's too much. It's just too much. So, so on your list, on my nano list, it's, it's just pick, pick one, just pick one thing. And, and let's say it's just having one less soda pop on Monday. And if you can't do that, then try half of one. Or if it's, if it's like, I'm gonna to go to the store and I'm going to buy, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to buy these healthy meats instead of these lunch meats. Do the things that you can, take these nano steps, write your own list of teeny tiny little steps. And if, if Something doesn't work, make the step smaller, but don't give up. That's why, that's why the Sunday night syndrome is so bad is we make all of these plans and then they don't work and then we give up on all of it. <laughs> nano steps, tiny, tiny little nano steps. One of the things that's really, really working against all of us also, and we need to work on this with our nano steps, is stress and cortisol. If you haven't heard of cortisol, cortisol is the stress hormone. We all, have, we all have cortisol. Our bodies are really good at manufacturing cortisol. Cortisol is, think of it as our fight or flight reflex. Okay, so the fight or flight re reflex is in us and it's in you know, a, lot of, a lot of animals. It's, it's so that we can run away when we see danger. But cortisol is really only supposed to, uh, only supposed to, to uh, activate our adrenal glands for like less than a minute. Really, I think it's something like 45 seconds. That's long enough for us to run away from that tiger or to get out of the quicksand or whatever because nature has pretty much said, well, if you can't get out of that by 45 seconds, then you're, you're just dead. You just deserve to die. Well, the problem is, is that because of our lifestyle, because of, because of news and because of our devices and because of our jobs and because of our relationships, we are cranking out cortisol all the time. We are all maxed out on cortisol. Our bodies are just going, oh, 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 I'm, I'm late for, oh, I got to do the, uh, this is, oh, so-and-so. I mean, seriously, cortisol, we're, we're full of it. And it's really, really hard to get cortisol out of there. And so the best, the best method is to start whittling away at it, nano steps, little by little by little, reducing stress, reduce stress, reduce stress. So, you know, one of the things that, that uh, <laughs> One of the things that I do is I just, I avoid the news and I, I avoid television. I mean, it's, it's just stressful to watch TV. Just the nature of it alone, because it's flashy and things are fast moving and all that sort of stuff. I choose the TV shows and the movies that I watch. Because if you watch a movie where, you know, there's somebody in danger, there are explosions and someone's trying to kill somebody and all that sort of stuff, that raises your cortisol level. So you watch a movie like that and then you go to bed, forget it. Our cortisol levels are, are, are so high, that is another, another one of the reasons why uh, uh, 
why people can't sleep, have, people are having so much trouble sleeping is because, is because their cortisol levels are really, really high. Um, so yeah, just stop watching the news. And because cortisol is a stress hormone, uh, it inhibits the manufacture of melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. So not only is, is cortisol alone keeping us from sleeping, it's keeping our bodies from manufacturing melatonin the way it naturally would so that we can sleep. I mean, it's just this double whammy of just bad, bad, bad. And I don't recommend taking melatonin because, uh, uh, you know, like, like uh, cortisol, melatonin is, is a hormone that, that our body makes to help us go to sleep. Uh, our body will naturally manufacture that in the evening when it starts to get dark. Our body just goes, oh, it's getting dark, so make, make melatonin. But if we start taking melatonin to help us sleep, then our body goes, oh, well, I already have, there's, there's melatonin here already. I don't have to make melatonin. So we're taking melatonin to help us sleep, but then the melatonin that we're taking tells our body to stop making melatonin. So it's just, so you're, you're just screwed. And speaking of interrupting our sleep, and this was one of the things, again, that, that was a big one for me that when I learned this is how important sleep is. Because for sleep, for, for me, was always one of those things where you don't really have to think about it or you don't have to, you don't have to do sleep because you just lay down and, and it kind of does itself. Um, well, because sleep is uh, so difficult for, for most of us uh, now, um, you know, it, it's, it's even more important because there are so many... Uh, there are so many systems in our bodies that are repaired uh, while we're sleeping. Uh, so the way that so the way that sleep works. So here again, we're gonna on the chart we're gonna do you know from from the time that we fall asleep to the time that, that we wake up. Okay. So during that time there, uh, what what a normal uh, human being does is we go through these. So so this is this is being awake, and down here is like deep sleep. So what happens when we, when we sleep, when we fall asleep, we go down into deep sleep and then we come back up to a light sleep. Here is where we, where we dream and usually when we wake up and we you know, go have a pee or whatever is because we're in this light sleep. And then it goes down into a deep sleep and then back up to a light sleep. And we go through this cycle. These, these cycles are, are an hour and a half, typically. And sometimes they're more in the beginning or shorter in the, you know, it, it just, it just depends, but it's in that range. So basically, you know, in, in an, an eight hour normal sleep, you have, what would it be? Five of those. So we're going through, we're going through these cycles of sleep. Okay. Deep. So this is when we're dreaming, but when we're in deep sleep down in here is where our body does all this magical, amazing repair. So what happens with us with, when we sleep lightly, is we're, we're never getting down into the repair, we're never getting down into the repair stuff. It's just sort of, you know, it's just sort of uh, not really very deep sleep. The deeper we go, the more repair there is. The longer we can maintain that deep sleep, the more repair there is. And so, so what I recommend, and, and I've, I've done these things myself, is um, uh, I bought curtains that are like the dark, darkening, room darkening curtains. And in the window that faces the front where the street is, I have two layers because they still weren't dark enough because what I, what I realized was that there were cars that were pulling out of the, the street across the street and the headlights would flash. Well, when I'm asleep, I could be, I could be in this deep sleep and be sleeping fine and the headlights would, would flash. Well, I wouldn't see them because they would just flash quickly, but that would pull me out of that deep sleep. Uh, it's the same thing with sound, and, and I have uh, a white noise machine. It's, it's the same thing with sound, where maybe the dog barks, the neighbor's dog barks for just a couple of minutes. It may not be enough for you to wake up and just go, ugh, stupid dog barking, but it may be enough to keep you or to bring you out of that deep repair sleep. So these are things that, w that, you, that we can do that are just sort of like, it's just sort of like having an ace up your sleeve. I'm, I'm going to do everything that I can to try and get myself into that, that best sleep possible. Another thing, and I know this is going to be really tough, but is, and there's science behind this, is the lower the temperature is when you sleep, the better we will sleep. Um, so, you know, if that means just having one less cover or whatever, what I've been doing is just because of the way that my house works, I just close the door and the room will just naturally be colder than if, I, if the door is open. 
uh, but just some way of, of getting that. I mean, I, I'm not saying change your thermostat every night or whatever. Maybe you can set it to do that or whatever. I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that, but it, it really, really works. I, I mean, I know I sleep so much better when, when, when the room is cold. But as far as this repair thing that I'm talking about, just, just think of it this way. It's kind of like, you know, we drive our car during the day, but at night we park it in the drive and, and you know, it just sits overnight. Well, for us, sleeping is, is the same way, but just imagine if when our car was sat there overnight, it was repairing itself. If, if it was doing a diagnostic and it was going, oh, well, I see that I need to tune this or I need to you know, adjust that or whatever. If the car did that all by itself, that's part of the magic of our body. Our bodies do that. All we have to do is just do all of these things in order to make sure that, that the, it's the lo highest likelihood that we're going to get deep sleep and the bo our body will just do it. And the, and the better our diet is, the more likely that it's going to be easier for our body to do that as well. Speaking of sleep, let's talk about morning routine. These are really, really simple things to do. Uh, and what's nice about them is like, you know, when you first wake up in the morning, you don't want to do a whole lot. It's like, oh, I'm just, you know, happy to be, you know, half asleep and all that sort of stuff. So these things are fairly easy to do because you, you just do them in your head. But they're really, really powerful and they're, they really, really help. So affirmations. So affirmations, for example, is so when, uh, when, when we first wake up in the morning, if we say, all right, I am going to have an awesome day. I feel strong. I feel young. I feel healthy. I am happy. I'm just going to have an awesome day. I'm going to have an awesome day. I really, really am going to enjoy this day. I am fit and strong. You know that a person who is thinking that when they first get up in the morning is going to have a way better day than someone who woke up going, oh, I feel like crap. Uh, and then when they go to bed, they're like, yeah, I was right. I did. I felt like crap. You know? Just affirmations, they're easy, even if you don't believe it. If you say it and it becomes part of your regular routine, your, your, your body will believe it because you're saying it and you start thinking it and it just becomes part of your subconscious. And then visualizations too. This one sounds kind of kooky, but... So like me, for example, when I, there was, when I was in my 20s, I was pretty, I felt pretty fit. I mean, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't as healthy as I, as I could have been, but I, I, but I felt pretty good. So when I first started going down this road, I would imagine, I would go back and I would imagine myself when I was in my 20s, and, and I would even, even look at photo, old photographs. If we can remember how we felt when we felt really good at some point in our life, and it could be even just be a couple of weeks ago, if we remember how, how it felt that time when we felt really, really good, and we think about how that feels and hold that with us while we're thinking I'm fit, I'm strong, I'm strong, our bodies will take that to mean that that's how I feel. Our body doesn't care if it's something that we're making up or if it's something that's real. It, 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 the, our body doesn't, doesn't have a filter for that. Whatever we think, our body just goes, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I get it. Our, our body will, will follow where our mind goes. What we think is what we get. It really, really is true. Part of the morning uh, routine is, <laughs> is uh, moderate exercise. Now, if you're anything like me, and I, I ho really hope that you're not, um, I, exercise just isn't something that has come easily for me, and it never has. Um, but the good, good, the good news is, is that most of the, the transition into a healthier version of ourselves comes from our diet. A very small amount of it has to come from exercise. Just because we, we're alive and we're up and we're moving around and all that sort of stuff, we don't, we don't necessarily have to uh, be doing like a big workout in order to make a big change. The biggest change will come from uh, changing our diet. Uh, but what will really help, and this goes back to the sleep thing too, is that there are studies, there are studies that have been done that have found that doing a little bit of moderate exercise first thing in the morning will actually help us sleep better at night. And I know that sort of, sort, of, sort of sounds the opposite of what you would think, where you would just think, well, if I do a really big workout you know, before I go to bed, I'll be all tired because I'll, I'll, I worked out and I'll sleep really well because, oh, I, you know. Well, what happens is, is when we work out really hard, we spike our cortisol manufacture. So our adrenal glands are going, ah. Well, because cortisol doesn't filter out of our system very easy, if we exercise at night or in the evening, it's going to keep us up. 
because our body's all, all stimulated. So what they found is just, and it can just be moderate exercise. So, um, so what, what really worked for me is just doing stretches. I mean, there's a, a website and they have a YouTube channel that's called fitnessblender.com. And you can go in there and you can, they have dozens if not hundreds of different videos of workout routines. And they're all the way from just doing simple little stretches all the way up to you know, complete uh, you know, week-long routines uh, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And you can go in and you just say, well, I'm looking for the simplest little thing that I can do. Because how many times have you heard, have you heard people or, um, or, or even myself, I mean, I had a treadmill at one time, where we'll go out and we'll, we'll spend $300 on this exercise equipment, or we'll spend all this money to join the gym or whatever, and it just, it just, it just goes to waste. To me, it's like, well, if I start doing stretches, and I do that every morning, or you're better off every other day because you have to, you have to rest, helps, helps, because... Down here, when we're sleeping, this is when we're this is when we're doing repair. That's when when we're actually burning fat and we're doing repair to our body. So you want to have you know some rest between your exercise. Um, but uh, uh, what was I saying? Moderate exercise in the morning. Moderate exercise in the morning. And. So what I do is, uh, so I'll, I'll just do a little bit of stretches. So if you're doing stretches every other day and you're really into it, you can add another sh short and stretch for five minutes. It will help you sleep better. It will help you feel better really, really well. Um, it's not like the coach back in junior high school. You got to go, go, go. You know, if, if you're not doing all this stuff, it's not working. And, you know, you don't have to do that. Any little bit helps. A little bit helps a lot. Um, but yeah, it just it it doesn't it doesn't really do us any good to uh, you know to do a big workout because um, we can do most of that with food. I say do do as much as as, as you want, but it it absolutely cannot substitute for having a, a healthy diet. There are people who are just like I'm going to work out in the gym. I'm going to do the marine training thing and all that sort of stuff and get fit and everything. And if you're not changing your diet, it's not gonna it's not gonna last. It's, it's what works for us, and the better I feel, the more I'm able to, and the more I feel like doing physical activity. We need to get some nature. Uh, this is one of the things that kind of blew me away, too, is that there have been studies that, done, that were done that, that if I am doing moderate exercise, if I'm looking out a window at nature, I actually get more benefit from that ac exercise if I'm just looking at nature. If we actually do our moderate exercise outside in nature, we get even more benefit from the exact same movement, from the exact same amount of time that is spent. Our bodies get more benefit from it. And that goes back to, to our caveman days, to, to you know, how we got here was because we, uh, we have survived this long because we were out chasing down our food in nature. So our body goes, oh yeah, 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 this is it, this is it, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Where if I'm just inside looking at a wall, our body is just going, all right, I got to get through this. I mean, it makes it easier, but there's actually real benefit to getting out in nature. So what I'm saying here is, you know, is that this is not some weird diet that I'm talking about. It isn't some trendy thing. It isn't some uh, strange thing where I'm saying you need to eat all bacon or you only should eat uh, green beans from a tin or you, you know, anything like that. What I'm saying is what we need to do is to eat a variety of real live whole foods. Real food. And just stop eating all of this manufactured crap. So look at it this way. I mean, I, you know, I, li I like to make these fun analogies. Look at it this way. Okay, so you know, I have this little backyard. You know, I like to sit and look at the bunnies and the rabbits out in the backyard. And one day I'm looking at the bunnies and the rabbits. I'm like, you know, bunnies and rabbits, are, they're kind of similar. You know, they're, kinda, they're small and they're furry and they're herbivores, and they hang around here all winter long, and you know, they're scurrying in the same, around in the same areas and all that sort of stuff. They're mammals, you know, they're, they're, they're very similar. But bunnies don't ever eat nuts, or at least I don't ever see them you know, scavenging for nuts the way squirrels do, and squirrels don't ever eat dandelions. So imagine if one day a, dand uh, if, imagine one day if, if a squirrel was like, you know what, this bunny seems to really like these dandelions, I'm gonna give it a try. Well, I know for a fact because I used to have a bunny. I had an indoor bunny. His name was Bunny. Um, bunnies just love, freaking love dandelions. You know, and if you smell them, they do have a really nice sort of sweet smell to them. And, and 
it, man, if I would bring dandelions to the bunny, it would, it would just go crazy for the, it would eat those over anything else, right? So obviously dandelions are good. But squirrels don't eat dandelions. So imagine if one day this, a squirrel goes, you know, what? I'm, I'm, I fancy these dandelions. I'm going to give this a try. So it starts eating dandelions. Oh my gosh, these are delicious. And they're everywhere. They, they grow like weeds. I'm just going to keep eating dandelions. As time goes by, the, the, uh, the squirrel starts, you know, putting on some weight and it starts having some digestive issues and it starts, doesn't, it doesn't feel very well. And, you know, it's just like, oh man, I... Uh, I'm just not feeling well. I lo freaking love these dandelions, but I'm just not feeling well. Another squirrel comes along and says, well, here, take this medication. If you take this medication, it'll make you feel better. Keep eating dandelions. No. What are we going to say to the squirrel? We're going to say, go back to eating squirrel food. That will solve everything. That is what is the problem with us human beings. We're eating the dandelions and we need to go back to eating nuts. So the takeaways are reduce carbohydrates. When we reduce carbohydrates, we will have more energy. We can eliminate brain fog. Um, our immune system will get stronger. I'm, I'm going to say one of those things that I, I, what I heard people say this on, in the beginning of my journey, it just, I just wanted to gag. I don't get sick. You, you won't, if, you're, if we are eating the right foods, we won't have colds all the time. We don't get sick all the time. We just don't. I heard a guy say that. I was on a, a it was a, you know, like a blog or something. Around, like, oh God, he's one of these, I don't get sick guys. Oh my gosh, it, it is so true. The amount, of, the amount of illness that that we have goes way, way, way down when we reduce our carbohydrates. Uh, eliminate those omega-6, eliminate those bad fats. Even if you keep on a carbohydrate diet, if you eliminate those bad fats, you will feel better. I promise you. But part of it is, is that a great deal of the carbohydrates that we eat have those bad fats in them anyway, so it would be kind of a double whammy. If you give up the fats, you're giving up the, the carbohydrates too. Sleep better, gotta sleep better, sleep better, sleep better. I could, I could do an hour talking about intermittent fasting, and I think uh, that's one of those things that if I understand right, is something that's kind of caught on where you hear more people talking about intermittent fasting and it's kind of a mystery as to what it is. Um, I'm gonna try and show it here on the chart, but it's kind of difficult to show because we're talking about a 24 hour day. So it's kind of hard to show that in a, in a, in a linear way. But the basic uh, idea of intermittent fasting is so that, so that we are eating, when we eat during the day, it's, it is a, in a short time window. Okay, so let's, let's say this is noon. And this is, this is the time during our day. Uh, uh, let's say this is midnight. Um, midnight. Okay, so what I, so a, a real easy example. So there are 24 hours in this day a real easy example is, is if I have my first meal at noon and then my second meal at four o'clock, so lunch and dinner, that means I've eaten in a four hour window. So I have two meals, no snacks, I have a four hour window. That means the, the 20 hours is fasting, but we sleep for about eight hours. So we're automatically gonna have, uh, we're gonna have an easy eight in there. So this is a 20 hour fast. If your last meal isn't at four, it's at six. Well, that's still an 18 hour fast. So you're adding on to your, on the ends of your sleep and trying to have your meal in a, in a short window. So you're gonna hear, hear people talk about uh, uh, one meal a day or OMED or whatever, whatever they say. Th those are people, and, and I've done this successfully and it's really, really awesome. So if you're having one meal a day, that means you're fasting for like 23, 24 hours. And so it's just like, well, what's this, you know, what's all this fasting, you know, about what's, why does fasting good and all that sort of stuff? Isn't that, you know, doing without food is bad, you'll die, you know. It's, what happens is, you know how I was talking about the magic of when you park your car at night, wouldn't it be cool if it could do a diagnosis and, and, and repair all of its stuff? What happens with the human body, and there's tons of science behind this, what happens with the human body is after we have fasted for 16 hours, and that's sort of like the minimum, but after we have fasted for 16 hours, there are all of these mechanisms that, that 
kick in in our bodies that start to repair, repair uh, on, a, on a cellular level. And those things don't kick in, though, until after it's been, we've been fasting for 16 hours. And that means no food. I mean, you can do water, you can do tea, you know, no sweeteners, but, but no food. You can't spike your insulin, like I was showing you in that first chart. You can't spike your insulin. So just imagine if you could take your car into the shop and say, well, it's not running right. I need you to, I need you to work on it. But I'm only going to give you two hours. Well, they're just going to go, well, we can't, we can't repair, do much repair. We can't do a diagnostic and a repair in two hours. But what if you took your car into the shop and you said, you can have as long as you want? They would just be like, OK. That would give them a chance to get in there and really dive into it and really make all of these really, really great repairs. Well, that's what, that's what fasting is like, is we're, we're giving our car as much time as we possibly can to do those repairs. And if we're eating the right foods, if, if, if our carbohydrates are low, it makes fasting way, 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 the, way, way easier. I mean, I, when I first started doing intermittent fasting, I was doing, my, my window wasn't four hours, it was eight hours. And I tried to get it down to six, I whittled it down to six, and that was, that was hard, trying to have my lunch and my dinner in a, within six hours of each other. Um, and so I lowered my carbohydrates even more, my carbohydrate intake even more. And then I got it down to six and four. Now I can do I can do one meal a day. I can do usually it's like three hours. So I'll so I will eat lunch at like around eleven or twelve, maybe one. And three hours later, I can tell that that I can tell that I'm actually really hungry because all of that good stuff that in there is gone. That was one of the most amazing things with, with this journey of me was was when I began to realize when I was actually really hungry, not just, oh, it's time to eat, or I would like to eat now, or uh, this sounds good, to where I'm just going, holy crap, I, I am genuinely hungry right now. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's kind of what the intermittent fasting thing uh, does. It, it is magical. And so I, uh, and, and again, I was talking about, you know, like at Christmas time when I'm still doing my apple cider vinegar, and I may not be eating a you know, a good carb-free diet, I'm still intermittent fasting. So even when I'm having a, you know, a, an off day, I'm just, I still don't eat breakfast. I still just have something at lunch and then have something at dinner because it just becomes part of your normal way of doing things. Your body gets used to it. It just becomes a, becomes a normal habit. So I intermittent fast every single day. We have choices. That's what this is all about, is we need to make better choices about what we uh, what we eat, because by by the choices that we make, all of the choices that we make, you know, they're all they're, they're all connected. We can improve uh, we can pr improve our lives. We can improve every aspect of our lives. And when we improve our lives, make our lives better, the 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 people around us, it makes their lives better also. I mean, what what we are, we put out. I just I I just can't tell you how important it is. Because I want all of you to be as healthy as you possibly can. Your healthiness and your happiness, they go together. And it just all comes down to those choices and those, those nano steps to make better, better, better choices, to make changes. Um, right now, there is a healthier person inside of all of us. So we're all on the scale from zero to 100. And zero is the person who isn't doing anything to improve their life. And 100 is the person who is climbing a mountain to, uh, to a natural spring to get water and they're growing their own food and they're, you know, they're hiking up that mountain and they're, that's, that's the hundred person. And then there's the zero person who doesn't do anything. Well, we're all in here somewhere. I mean, all of us are, and, and that's okay. As long as we are moving toward, moving toward the, that 100 end, because as time passes, we naturally fall toward the zero end. And so we, we just need to ask ourselves, will I be more fit or less fit in the future? Five years, 10 years? Because odds are I'm going to be less fit just because I'm aging. There's an ancient proverb that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. <laughs>